السلام بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله والصحب أجمعين وبعد First of all, I would like to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving us this opportunity to come together uh, tonight, Thursday night, which is the night of which day in which month in the Hijri calendar? What's tomorrow in Hijri calendar? Which, well, first of all, which month are we in? We tend to forget that we get involved in the Christian calendar and we forget our own calendar. Uh, tomorrow's what date? Friday, what's the, what's the date though? The 14th, you sure? So it's the, now we're the night of the 14th. Because Islam, like, when, when does the day start? After Maghrib. So it's the night of the 14th, we'll say. And this is the first time shall we'll come together with our brothers and sisters at the Jumeirah Islamic Learning Center. And I'd like to thank the sisters in charge here for inviting me. And I was supposed to come last week, but unfortunately, uh, I, I just bought a car and I went to get it registered and everything. They said everything will be ready at 12 o'clock. I got home at 10 o'clock at night. So it took me about eight hours to get everything done. And Brother Muhammad Nubi, may Allah bless him, he stepped uh, up in, in the last, and he had actually one hour before the lecture or two hours, and he came to Zahm and gave the lecture last time. So this will be my first lecture here. And I believe, inshallah, we'll also be doing a monthly lecture here as well. I believe if it hasn't been changed. It will be on the first of each month, inshallah ta'ala. And the title we have chosen to start our series of lectures is 10 ways to fill your heart with the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 10 ways to fill your heart with the love of Allah. And obviously, when we look at the importance of this topic, the fact that our heart is going to be filled with something, for love of something, uh, of this dunya or something. And so we should focus on filling with the most important thing, and that is with the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because if our hearts become filled with the love of Allah, then every other, all of our concerns, inshallah, will be taken care of, and we won't focus on anything except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Shaykh al-Islam, rahimahullah, he mentioned that the mahabba, the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said it is from a'zam wajibat al-Islam. It's from the greatest uh, things that are wajib or compulsory of your iman in Islam. And he said it's from the biggest uh, fundamentals of iman and the best of its foundations, or most important of its foundations. Until he went on to say, rahimahullah, that everything that's done in existence, it's done and it's built on love, love for something, whether it's for something bad or for something good. And when you see people now, whenever they do th things in the dunya, it's because of the love they have for something. Now, I was giving an example to, my, to the kids I was teaching in school today and the other day uh, about the World Cup when it happened last year. You would find people wearing a certain player's jersey. Everybody was going crazy and infatuated with him. Who was it? Everywhere you go, his picture's everywhere. It's on everything. Uh, who is it? What's the guy? Don't pretend like you don't know. I know you know. <laughs> uh, who is the guy's name? Must see or Miss see. How do you say it? Must see, huh? Uh, everybody. Why do I do it? Because they're in love with this guy. They're infatuated with him. So now you can fill your heart with, with love or something like that or, or things of the dunya. Or you can fill your heart with the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So anything person does, you see, why do you wear the must see uh, jersey? They say because I, I, I love him as a player. That's why he's in, he, he has this love, that's why he does it. So his, his action was built upon love. So this is why we need to fill our hearts with the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so our actions in this dunya will be solely for him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And these 10 ways, it's not something I came up with, it's something that Ibn Al-Qaim uh, mentioned rahimahullah. And um, it was also explained by one of the scholars that, uh, of, of today he explained these 10, and I benefited obviously from his book when in this uh, lecture. And also it's been translated, these 10 have been translated. I found actually after I had translated them and, and done the lecture some time back, that uh, Darul Salam, they have a book, it's, um, I think it's called Gems and Jewels or something like that. Yeah, it's in there, you can find these 10 in there, it's like two pages in there, if you want to go back to that in the future, inshallah ta'ala. So the first of these ways that Ibn Al-Qaim rahimahullah ta'ala mentioned, for us to fill our hearts with the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is by reading the Qur'an and reflecting and trying to understand its meanings. Reading the Qur'an and trying to reflect 
and try to understand its meanings. So, and this is why the Quran was, was sent down. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran and Surah Sa'd, Kitabun anzalnahu mubarak. Why? What's, who, who knows the ayah? لِيَدَّبُّرُ آيَاتِهِ وَلِيَتَذَكَّرُ أُولُ الْأَلْبَابِ So he said it was a book that was sent down, Mubarak, a blessed book, a book of blessing, a book of barakah. And today the Muslims, they focus on this a lot, alhamdulillah, still, that it's a book of barakah. You'll find now that when he comes to the Qur'an, you'll find him, you know, kissing it, putting it on his forehead because it's a book of barakah, it's a book of blessing, this is true. During certain times, you'll find him reading the Qur'an because it's a book of barakah, it's a book of blessings. Also, even sometimes you'll see he puts it on the dashboard of his car, mashallah, because it's, it's barakah. Even some go to the extent where they put it where? On top of the television, on the receiver, for the barakah in the house. And he sits there and watches uh, Showtime and uh, NBC and these things, and he has the Quran in front of him on top of the receiver, Allah was done. So now, this is one of the reasons it was, it's a, it's a book of barakah, no doubt. But the main reason it was sent down is for us to reflect on understanding the meanings. And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, he said, whoever loves the Qur'an, then he loves Allah and his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Whoever loves the Qur'an, then he loves Allah and his messenger. And the Qur'an, we are in need of the Qur'an in our lives. Because the Qur'an has what we need. It has hudan, it has guidance, and it has shifa lima fi sudur. It has a cure for what's in our hearts, from the diseases, the diseases in our hearts. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in Surah Al-Fussilat, Surah Al-Fussilat, he says, "Qul huwa uh, huwa al-ladina amanu hudan wa shifa." It is for the, those who believe a guidance and a cure for what is in their chest. So it cures the diseases we have in our hearts. Shifa li ma fi sudur, as Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said in Surah Yunus. So this is one of the main things we gain from the Quran. We reflect on the meanings of the Quran, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, He made not reflecting on the Quran for those who just read the Quran or don't reflect on the meanings of the Qur'an, he made it an aib, a fault. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Muhammad verse uh, 24, أَفَلَا Do they not reflect on the meanings of the Qur'an or are there locks on their hearts? And the person who doesn't reflect, he's the one who has put the lock on his heart. He has chose to lock his heart so the khair and the good will not enter it because he's not reflecting on the meanings of the Qur'an. And when we reflect on the meanings of the Qur'an, this is one of the best ways, as the scholars mentioned, for you to understand the Qur'an. And you won't get true understanding unless you really reflect on the meanings. And to reflect on the meanings, obviously, it's very important, the Arabic language. Those of you who cannot speak Arabic, you'll never be able to have a true understanding of the beauty of the Qur'an unless you can understand the language of the Qur'an. And even when it comes to the, the Nahu, the Arab, and I give a small example always when I teach the students when we come to Surat, uh, Al-Asr and in Surah Al-Asr it's a small surah but the meanings are very very strong and if you don't understand the Arabic language you're never going to be able to understand the true meanings and beauty behind it and if you look for example well, Al-Asr this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is swearing by time and he can swear by whatever he wants subhanahu wa ta'ala and the humans can only swear by Allah so he swears by time it shows us the importance of time inna al-insana lafi khusrin now this in, in Arabic language you have what they call the ta'kid to put emphasis on something. How many of them, there's, there's several of them in, in this ayat itself. And when you understand this in Arabic, it shows you the, the strength of this ayat itself. But we'll just look at it as something very small if you don't know the meaning, we look at the translation. So we need to know the language of the Quran and focus on understanding the language of the Quran. Now let's go back to reflecting on the meaning of the ayat. Now, we could read, for example, a simple verse. خَلَقَ اللَّهُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ بِالْحَقِّ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He created the heavens and earth with truth. Does anybody have doubt about this? It's something simple, something basic. Hey, but what do you want to do? Now we've read this verse, let's go and reflect on the creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the heavens and the earth. When you go outside and you look at uh, the sky, the moon, the stars, you look at the ocean, you look when you go to the beach, you reflect on the, the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what it's calling to do, reflect on His creation and all, all, all that's in the heavens and the earth. When you start to reflect on this, it shows you the greatness of who? Of the Creator, of Al-Khaliq subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you focus on these meanings, when you focus on, on reflecting on the ayat. And then, when you focus on the meanings, it shows you the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this, this fills your heart, obviously, with the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because He's the Creator of all of these beautiful things we see in front of us. And this will call us, inshallah, to become closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and focus on filling our hearts with His love 
only subhanahu wa ta'ala. For the importance of the Qur'an and focusing on learning the Qur'an, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to encourage the Sahaba by saying to them, خَيْرُكُمْ مَنْ تَعَلَّمَ الْقُرْآنَ وَعَلَّمَهُ That the best of you are the ones who learn the Qur'an and then taught it to others. So they would strive to learn the Qur'an. And we look at the danger of not acting upon what's in the Qur'an. They call it the hajr of the Qur'an. To actually boycott the Qur'an. There's several different ways of boycotting the Qur'an. It could be from not reading it. And this is, I think most of us, unfortunately, Allah Musta'an have fallen into this, where most Muslims, they barely read it. Or, mashallah, they read it, Yom al Jum'ah, they read maybe Surah al kaf If they find some free time here and there, if they go to the masjid early by mistake, yeah, if they get there before, they didn't mean to get there before the iqamah, but he got there that day, so he said, why not? Bismillah, open up the Quran and read it. And then in Ramadan, mashallah, tabarakallah, and he's very good in Ramadan. He's a Ramadan Muslim, mashallah. But other than that, subhanAllah, unfortunately, we don't, we, a lot, most of us don't focus on reading the Qur'an. So that's one way of making hajr, a boycott in the Qur'an. Another way, Ibn Qayyim mentioned maybe five other ways, and from that is not listening to or the iman which what comes in it. And obviously that can lead to kufr if you do not have iman and faith in what comes in the Qur'an. And also, after that, the second thing he mentioned was not acting upon what is in the Qur'an, that which is halal and haram in the Qur'an, we're not reading it for barakah to know it. So when Allah says, do this, don't do that, we're supposed to act upon it as Muslims. So if you don't do that, you're actually from the people who are making hajr, who have boycotted the Qur'an and not focused on benefiting from the Qur'an. And the third thing he mentioned, rahimahullah, was not ruling by what's in the Qur'an. And it's as, as you know, several ayat that you must go back to the Qur'an if you want to be a true believer and you want to, must act upon what's in the Qur'an and only rule by the rulings which is in the Qur'an and nothing else. The fourth thing he mentioned, and this is what the type we're talking about, is not reflecting on the meanings, making the hajr or the boycott of not reflecting on the meanings of the Qur'an and trying to understand the Qur'an. And the fifth thing he mentioned, rahimahullah, was uh, looking for the cure in the Qur'an. The cure, whether it's from the cure what's for what's in your heart, by cure what's in your heart from the diseases of the heart, or even other diseases, which are in the body as well. Because the Qur'an itself, it's shifa, not just for what's inside, but also for the body parts itself. And that was confirmed in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu when the Sahaba, they made the ruqya, the person who had been uh, bitten by the scorpion, and it cured him, the Surah Al-Fatiha. Ibn Al-Qim, he mentioned in the beginning of a book, Da'wa Dua, he mentioned himself, that Ibn Al-Qaim, does anybody know where he's from, by the way? He's from uh, the Syrian area, Rahimullah, in Sham. So he went to Mecca, and obviously a person, when he's in an area he doesn't know, he might not find the, 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 the things he needs. Ibn Al-Qaim, he was actually a doctor himself, where he would make the herbal medicines and things like this. So he said, I couldn't find the medicines I needed because obviously he knew where to go in his, in his country, but he didn't uh, know where to go in Mecca. So he said, I started to cure myself with Surah Al-Fatiha. And he said, I, I found in it you know, the cure for any several of the diseases that I had or the problems he had in his body. So curing yourself is not just by reading it for what's in your heart, also for other diseases, pain in your body, what have you. And this is something I have witnessed myself as well. When you focus on it and you have the iman in it, inshallah, you will find the cure. Ibn Taala. Ibn Qayyim mentioned something beautiful as well, which is how can you, what, or what are the ways to make you make it easier to reflect on the ayat? The ways to make it easier for you to reflect on the ayat. And he said the best way to do this is to imagine that Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is talking to you when you're reading the ayat. You imagine this is Allah talking to you, and He is in the in, in, in this way. He's talking to all of us, obviously, as Muslims. So you say you hear that Allah Subhanahu wa He's talking to you, He's commanding you. This helps you focus on the meaning which comes in the verses itself. This is the first point. The first way to fill our hearts with the love of Allah is reflecting on the meanings and trying to understand the meanings of the Quran. The second way to fill our heart with the love of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is by coming closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by doing the nawafil, the voluntary acts after we do that which is fard, after we do which is fard, is compulsory upon us in Islam. And this came in the hadith al-Qudsi when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, مَا تَقَرَّبْ إِلَيْ عَبْدِي بِشَيْءَ أَحَبَّ إِلَيْ مِنْ مَفْتَرَطُ عَلَيْ وَمَا يَزَالْ عَبْدِي يَتَقَرَّبْ إِلَيْ بِالنَّوَافِلْ حَتَّى أَحِبَّ The Allah said that my servant does not become closer to me 
was something more beloved to me than that which I have made fard compulsory upon him. And then my servant continues to become closer to me with the nawafil, the voluntary actions, until I love him. So now, with this action here, we're actually filling our hearts with the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At the same time, if we do it, Allah will love us as well, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's a great reward, obviously. Here's a question we might want to ask, especially people might ask, and we have something that's followed compulsory. Why do we have things, actions, that are nafil, that are, are voluntary in Islam? What is the hikmah behind the Prophet ﷺ making these things that are sunnah for us uh, to do? What do we gain from it? The floor is open. I'm That's the first point. Good. I, I got it. I got it. So now the first one is if there's any shortcomings in our fard prayer or the fard action, you actually make it up by doing this. And that came in the hadith, the meaning of the hadith, which came in Sunni Imagine, it's an authentic hadith, where also in the hadith of Qudsi, where he said, Unduru, and he's saying to the, the angels, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Hal abdi min Does he have any voluntary acts so he can finish with it his uh, faridha? He can finish with it his compulsory act. So this is the main thing is that any shortcomings, a lot of them we have them now. Because when does the shaitan focus on reminding us things all the time? As soon as we say Allahu Akbar, he comes to you with the wahi, the revelation, he comes to you and reminds you of everything. And it could be important things too. And it could be very, very important. So the shaitan, he comes and he confuses in our salat all the time. So you feel our salat is never, most of the time it's not complete anyways. And unfortunately this is something that's happened to a lot of Muslims around the world where they don't focus on their salats. And a story that's mentioned when you talk about not focusing on what's in the Salat is a story that happened in, a, in one place in Saudi Arabia, I, was, I believe it was to the south in Saudi Arabia, in the southern part, where a man used to pray Dhuhr and Asr as the Imam in the Souq, in the market there every day for any, any several years or several months or whatever. And he was the Imam. Every time he came, he would pray Dhuhr and he would pray Asr, because that's the time he was in the market there. So one time for Salat al-Dhuhr, they said that he had prayed only three rakats. So when he sat down, they started to, you know, say, Subhanallah, Subhanallah, and make him know he has to get up. He didn't move, he didn't budge. Subhanallah, Subhanallah, the whole masjid, Subhanallah. He didn't move. He said, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. They said, you only prayed three rakats, eh, Sheikh? He said, no. He said, I prayed four. They said, no, you prayed three. He said, I prayed four. And they kept, and they kept going back and forth, three, four, three, four. So he got upset. He said, look, he said, I'm going to be with you. Because I want to prove to you that I only prayed, uh, that I prayed what? Four. He said, so you know, ever since I've been the imam, he said, as you know, I have four stores in the market here. So he said, every time I go to each store, and I make sure, see, what do we need, what do we need in this thing. So as I go, I go over everything that's in the store in each rakah. He probably goes to the bigger store in the first rakah, and then when the store gets smaller, he goes to the next one after that. But anyways, he goes to all of his stores in each rakah. So this guy not even, doesn't have no clue what he's talking about in the prayer, and he's the imam. And after that, subhanAllah, he's, just, he, he's going to the, the dunya, to the stores. This is what shaitan does to us. He comes to us, and he what? He starts to remind you things. And don't forget, he said, you, you know, your wife has a doctor appointment tomorrow. And you forgot all about it. You would have been in big trouble if you went home and I forgot about it. He reminds you. So it's important or not, because you would have gotten in trouble if he didn't remind you. But it, the goal is not to, so you don't get in trouble, so you lose the, the reward of the, of the salat. So this is what shaitan does to us. This is one of the things that makes up for us any shortcomings. Also, one of the benefits is just like when you exercise. If you want to go for a jog now, or you want to do some push-ups or lift some weights or whatever, what's the first thing you do? A warm-up. You have to do the warm-up. You have to stretch out, stretch out and, uh, and get a warm-up. Then you start. Also, when you go in, for example, into the prayer, you're coming from the dunya. So it's actually like a warm-up, introduction to the prayer. If you do the sunnah before it, and also, this is a way for you to start to forget about the dunya things. Because the two rakats, if shaitan attacks you and knows more, it'll make your, your fard better. So it's also a warm-up for the fard prayer as well. When it comes to the people who are doing the sunnah and the people who are not, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Fatir, verse 32, He made the Muslims into three categories. He made it clear that all Muslims are three categories. He said, فَمِنْهُمْ ظَالِمُ لِنَفْسِهِ from them is the one who is oppressing himself. How is he oppressing himself? What does he do? What does a Muslim do to oppress himself? No, man. Huh? 
committing shirk, khalas, he left, he's a kafir, he leaves Islam. But the, that's the biggest, in the shirk, it's the biggest, the biggest oppression is shirk, obviously, but you leave Islam. Somebody else mentioned it? By committing sins. The person who commits sins, I'm sorry, I keep hitting the microphone, because you know, I use my hands a lot, but I'm trapped with the microphones in front of me, so you have to forgive me. The, the thing is now, the, the sins, and the person who commits sins, he doesn't do what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded him to do. He doesn't, uh, he, he does what Allah told him not to do. So he, who is he harming? Is he harming Allah? He's harming himself only. And now on the day of judgment, you know, even the, the mankind, you're harming yourself. The main person you're harming is yourself. Even if you harm other people, what you do, but the main harm will come back to yourself in this life and also in the hereafter. In this life, how? Because you will never find peace of heart and peace of mind if you're far away from the manhaj, the methodology that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told you to be on. And Allah made this very clear. He said, وَمَنْ أَعْرَضَ ذِكْرِي فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِشَةً ضَنْكَ Whoever turns away from my remembrance, he will live a difficult or a miserable life. And this is the reality of the people who turn away from the remembrance of Allah. And then he said, أَلَا بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ تَطْمَئِنُّ قُلُوبِ Verily through the remembrance of Allah, hearts will be assured. So if you turn away from this, you're only oppressing yourself. The second category is the muqtasid. What does the muqtasid mean? Hey, only the fraid. He's staying away from haram. He's doing halal, but he's only doing the fraid. He's not doing much more. He's not what he's supposed to, alhamdulillah. He's not doing what he's not supposed to be doing, alhamdulillah. He's, just, he's on khair, but he's just there in the middle. He's not going up and he's not going down to the other level. And the other one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described him as being what? Sabiq bil khairat. Somebody who is racing to do good deeds. And he's sabiq, he's racing to do good. So this is what we want now from the Muslim, is he tries to do as much good as he can. He focuses on doing as much good as he can. And when you do this, as the Prophet said, he said that khair al-amal, the best of the deeds are which ones? The ones that are consistent. Adwa muha, wa qalb. That are the, the consistent ones, even if they're a small amount. So that's why a Muslim now, when it comes to his uh, nawafil, he should have a consistent pattern. There are other things you can do, like to have a tashkil, to change the vibe, as we would say. To change it in different things. For example, today you say, let's go pray on a janazah. There's a famous masjid here, for example, in Dubai, where they always pray the janazah. I'm sure there is. You say, let's go pray on a janazah today, get reward. Let's go visit the sick people in the hospital. This is something new and something to get reward from. It's a good thing to do. And the Sahaba used to focus on doing these type of things. But you have, for example, your main routine. You have the rawatib, the 12 sunnah prayers. You have the adhkar al-sabah al masa for example. You read the juz of the Quran. You pray in half an hour, qiyam al or something like this. You have a certain thing that you never leave. You have to have this. And then you start to do other things to make it more interesting. And the scholars took that from this. For example, when you go, if you go now and look tonight in Hassan al-Muslim. Everybody knows Hassan al-Muslim, uh, what do you call it, the fortress or the Muslim? Which is the, the small dua book. Look at the dua of istiftah, the opening dua you make at the salat. How many are there in the book? Several of them. What are from the hikmah of this is so you change it. You change the style. You don't get caught up in the same routine all the time. If you look, for example, the, the, the adhan. There's different, there's the, the adhan, which is the, the adhan of Bilal. It's fair, the famous, most famous adhan. Uh, you have the adhan of Abi Mahdura, also which is uh, in Sahih Muslim, where he did it in a different style. Uh, you studied it in fifth, inshallah, but he did it in a different style. So if, if one to change up, obviously if you're in a country who won't let you do that, then you don't do it. But in a country where you're allowed to change it like that, you do that to, to, to change it up. The salam and the salat, the Prophet ﷺ used to say, As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah, as-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. But there are other ways he would do it in different ways. I don't want to go in detail, I don't want to go too far off the subject. But these are the other different ways you can find them in the books of fiqh. The point is, is to change up the style, to change the vibe, to make your ibadah more interesting. The third point, or the third way to fill our hearts with the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what? Constantly remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all situations. Constantly remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all situations. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Ali Imran verse 191, The ones who remember Allah as they are standing, and as they are sitting, and as they are on their sides, meaning laying down. Is there any other way you can remember Allah? That's all the situations basically. All the situations you could be in, either standing, sitting, or laying down. And this is a, a, a guidance for us, to guide us to always be remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said when one of the sahaba came to him, and he said to, for advice, he said, لا يزال لسانك رطبا بالذكر الله That your tongue should stay moist with the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're constantly remembering Allah. 
And we look at our scholars, the scholars who implemented Islam and practiced Islam, you'll see that they were constantly always remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even when you look in the books of Hadith, uh, the stories of the Muhaddithin, the great scholars of Hadith, for example, they say in the Majlis, the sitting of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, 5,000 people used to attend his lesson, his day lesson, 5,000. So they said, 500 of them only were the real students of knowledge who actually wrote everything he said, who were writing down everything. The other 4,500, they said they came to benefit from his beautiful manners, Rahimullah, because they saw his manners, he, he implemented and acted upon Islam in his life. Even he said once, he said, I never learned anything from the Sunnah unless I implemented it, even if it was just one time in my life. So he was a person who was upon the Sunnah and implement the beautiful morals and the akhlaq of our beloved Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. So 4,500 people were just benefiting from that, and other 500 were uh, just taking take from his knowledge. Imagine now in this small tube room place where we're sitting, if I was talking without the microphone. I have a loud voice, I'm a teacher by profession, so I talk rather loudly. But maybe other speakers, even maybe myself, even some of the sisters in the back, might not hear everything I say if we turn off the microphone. Imagine now 5,000 people how did they used to hear Imam Ahmed? And this for me, when I, when I read it, I knew it was authentic narration, but I found some difficulty. How could 5,000 people hear him? Until I learned, we studied in the College of Hadith when I was there for a year and a half before I transferred to another college uh, in, the, in Medina, in the university there, that they had something called the Muballig, the person who would and he take the Isnad or what the Sheikh said from the Hadith, he would take it, it'd be like somebody in this corner, and he would pass it back to the next one, and there would be official people called the Mubalik who would relay what the Sheikh said. So he would say, for example, if any, any Muhaddith scholar, for example, would say, Haddathan Waqi'ah. We have from the famous scholars of Hadith, Waqi'ah told us or informed us. He would say this, it would go to number one, number two, number three, until it reaches like six or seven in the back. And then the Sheikh, because he wanted to make sure that nothing happened to the Hadith of the Prophet, it had to come back to him. So he would say, Hadith and and number one would go to two, to three, to four, until it reaches seven. Seven says it again, six says it. They said it said twice. To make sure everybody there hears it, and to make sure it comes back to the Sheikh correctly. So what was the Sheikh doing during this time? You know, it takes a, maybe a minute or, so, or something like that for it to come back. He would be remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, Allah Akbar, making istighfar, benefiting from his time. And I recall from the first time I met Sheikh Mubaz, Rahimullah, and he was the one who helped me get into the University of Medina. May Allah uh, have mercy upon him. When I first met him, and he, he was, this is how he was, subhanAllah. He was always remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I mean, the first time I went and I, and I visited him, uh, there was a whole big group of people. All of them wanted, you know, he had this big file. People reading to him, I need this, I need help with that. And he's answering the fatwas on the phone. And any second, and he has, subhanAllah, alhamdulillah. I remember when I first met him, he was talking, he actually had a phone call from France sister from France, he was asking, she was asking questions, and he told her after this, go, I still remember, he said, go to the store of the embassy, I'm gonna send books there to you in Paris at the embassy. So he was talking on the phone, and he puts the phone down for a second, and he'll say, SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah. And then when he puts the phone, he, he waits before the guy starts reading, SubhanAllah, Allah Akbar, La ilaha, Astaghfirullah. He's making dhikr, he's always benefiting from the time. So this is how the real Muslim should be. Look at the time we waste each day. Sometimes, for example, you go to do something, uh, in, a, in a government building or something, you have to wait in line, you get a number, and you wait. You go to the bank, you wait. We, we just sit there. Or what do we do now? What are we good for now, everybody? Uh, the phone. There's everybody now, because we, so we, we can waste our time. We start with the phone and start texting or this, or even not, not doing anything, just playing with the phone. We might not have anybody to call or anybody to talk to, we play with the phone and waste our time. So imagine the time we could benefit from if we remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the goal now, by remembering Allah, is to fill our hearts with the love of Allah. So we're constantly remembering Allah and thinking of Allah, our hearts will become full with His love subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you look at the status of dhikr, of the remembrance of Allah in the Quran, in Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, he didn't just order us to remember Him, He ordered us to remember Him a lot. If you look at the Quran, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, for example, in Surah Al-Ahzab, He says, Ya ayyuhaladheena amanu, udhkuru Allah dhikran kathira. He says, O you who believe, Remember Allah, not just remember Allah, dhikran kathirun, a lot of remembrance. And then he said also in Surah Al-Jum'ah, verse 10, وَذْكُرُ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ So if you want to be successful, he said what? If you want to be successful, وَذْكُرُ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا Remember Allah a lot. 
And then he described the dhikr as well, subhanahu wa ta'ala, as being akbar, as being the greatest. Well, the dhikrullahi akbar, it's the greatest thing. Why is it the greatest thing? Because all of the other acts of worship in Islam, what's meant by them is the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even from the names of a salat is a dhikr, it's a, it's a reminder. So it's to remind us of Allah. And the hajj, and the siyam, if you go back to the verses in the Quran, you'll find also, and these type of things. So you want to make the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the goal behind all of these acts of worship, is the remembrance of Allah. So through the remembrance of Allah, inshallah ta'ala, we will find, inshallah, the, uh, we'll fill our hearts with the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The fourth way to fill our hearts with the love of Allah is by preferring that which Allah loves to that which our desires and our lust want to do when they get the best of us. Our loves and our desires when they get the best of us, we prefer that which Allah loves to that which our desires love. And all of us have desires. Every human being has desires. And these desires can lead you obviously to that which is haram, obviously. So when a person comes to the, and this is the big test, because as they say, actions speak louder than words. So all of us say we love Allah. And we love the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this, we say it on our tongue, all Muslims say it on their tongues. But when it comes to the reality of it, and we look at the situation of the Muslims, we don't, we don't see it in the actions. So if you're in, honest in your heart with your love of Allah and the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it's going to show in your actions. So now, when we're sitting down or watching, for example, football or something on, on the TV, and the Adhan goes, and it's time for Salat, and it's, it's like, you know, it's tied one to one, and it's like 70 minutes and you know, 20 minutes left. What are we going to do? It's very, very difficult. Because what do you, in your heart, you know, you love Salat and you love Allah, you do, and, and you, you want to stay, you want to see the end of the match. It's a very, very important match to you. So now what, to get up and go is difficult. Now, when you want to follow the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in any aspect in life, it might, it might be difficult to do. For example, a man wants to grow his beard or something like that. Because now the society, you look strange, you look this. The Prophet ﷺ, he said that Islam started strange and it will return strange. So, Tuba al Ghurba. Tuba, which is in the Jannah. So, this is that the Jannah will be for those who are from the strangers. Anyways, the point is, is that when it comes time for that which, you, which your desires want and that which Allah wants from us, which one do you put in front? If you start putting in front that which Allah and He wants from us, then inshallah your heart will start to become full with the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Ibn Muqaym, rahimahullah, he's the one who mentioned these 10 points and we keep mentioning also his explanation from him because his books are very beneficial in this. He mentioned that there's three ways for us to be successful when it comes to uh, fighting off our desires, when it comes to the situation. And he said the first thing is you have to defeat the desires of yourself. You have to defeat it because it's a, it's, a, it's a battle. It's a battle. You're either going to go to Jannah or you're going to go to the hellfire, one of the two. This is the dunya. Just like when you're in the, in your, you were in high school or you went to college, it's a, you have to strive to be successful. If you want to get into a good college, what do you have to do? You have to study. If you want to graduate from the college, you have to study. It's a battle. Also, your life in this dunya, it's a battle because you're being tested. So you have to now defeat. You're at war. You have to defeat the desires of yourself. After that, you have to go against the desires of the people. Second thing is to go against the desires of the people. Because what do the people want you to do? What do the people want you to do? They want you to be on the Salat al-Mustaqeem and do good deeds and stay away from bad deeds. They want you to, to follow them and their shahwat and their lust. And they want you to be with them. Now if somebody starts to practice, what are you doing? Don't be, so, don't be an extremist. I want to pray five times a day. I have a beard. Don't be an extremist. What am I being extreme? I want to look like the Prophet Sallallahu and I want to pray five times a day. What's extreme about that? SubhanAllah, oh, it's too extreme. It's too and he, they say, Khalik flexible, be flexible, huh? SubhanAllah, <laughs> this is what they want. Alhamdulillah, <laughs> what's wrong with what we're doing? We're not being any... Uh... So this is the thing, you have to go against, because the people are going to call you. Uh, the people are going to call you to evil, so you have to go against their desires. That's the second point. The third point is the mujahidah, that you have to strive against shaitan and his followers. Because obviously they want to pull you with them, as it's going to come into the hellfire. So we have to strive against them. These three points, I think they're very important. So I want to stop at each point a little bit to explain it. The first one is that you strive against your own self and in your own desires. 
It was said to Al-Hasan al-Basri, Al-Hasan al-Basri rahimahullah, Ya Aba Sa'id, Ayyul jihad afdal? It was said to Abu Sa'id is kunya, which form of jihad is best? And he said, jihadik hawak, uh, for you to go against your, your jihad, waging jihad, or striving against your own desires. He said, this is the best type of jihad. And that's why Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he said that the, the asl, the origin of jihad itself, is for you to defeat yourself. And then he said, how can a person be successful in defeating the enemy on the battlefield if he can't even defeat himself to do that which is fard and to stay away from that which is haram? He won't be successful. And that's the problem with the Muslims today. Because we see what's happened to our brothers around the Muslim world, but unfortunately, we, we can't do anything about it because we're so messed up ourselves and we're following haram and not doing halal. So we're not successful. It's a, it's a ibtila, it's a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah forgive all of us. But now, we talked about the mujahid, that we strive, you have to strive. In Islam, obviously you have to strive if you want to be successful. Here are some interesting points that Ibn al-Jawzi mentioned, rahimahullah, about how to be successful when it comes to the mujahid, to striving against your own self. He said, first of all, it's for you to think and to reflect and to remind yourself that humans were not created for this quick amusement or, 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 or fun and games. Why were we created? For the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That does not mean that we cannot have fun as Muslims. Alhamdulillah we can have fun, but it's not the goal we were created for. And the problem now is that people, they want to have fun and games all the time and, and laugh and joke, and they don't want to be, have any ibadah, any worship. So worship is why we were created. But we can also have fun and games as well as we go through life. But it's obviously in the field that's halal, obviously. So the first thing we remind ourselves is it's not why we were created. Especially if it's something haram, obviously, you must stay even farther away from it. He said, secondly, think about the dangers and the ill effects of following your own desires. Now, if somebody, for example, were to go to a Western country or even in a Muslim country and study in a university. When you go to the university, if anybody ever studied in the Western university, here in the room here, yes or no? Huh? Where at you study? In France. Anybody in this? Eh? UK. Okay, maybe the UK is like America, but I'll, I'll speak of America what I know. In America, the kids, they go to the university when they're 18 years old, and this is the first time they've ever been away from yani, the eyes of their mothers and their fathers. So they go there and they party. They just get drunk like crazy for about three years, and they come to the fourth year, all of a sudden they, oh yeah, we're about to graduate. So we have to know something about what we're about to get a degree in. So they buckle down for the last year. So if a Muslim were to go into be into this type of environment, everybody's getting blasted, getting drunk, night and day. Is it easy for a Muslim to, you know, they're having, look like they're, it looks like they're having fun anyways. So is it easy for a Muslim to say no to this type of, if he's in this environment? It's not easy. And we'll be honest. But even though, even Josie here, he's saying, think about the ill effects. Think if you were to drink alcohol. First of all, it's displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, the ill effects, why is it called umul khaba'ith? All of the things you can do because you lose your aql, you lose your mind, your sanity. So if you start to do things, you're not going to even know what you're doing. How many people have killed people in car accidents? People have, have uh, done things to their own family members and stuff like that because they're drunk and they don't know what they're doing. That's why it's haram in Islam. The third thing he mentioned is the person who is, is sane. For him to reflect and ask himself the pleasure that you're gaining while you're doing that which is haram, to think about how you will feel after it's over. And we can give an example with the Muslim who fornicates. When he's fornicating, is he enjoying himself? Most likely, yes. And it's a human instinct for male and female to have desires for one another. So when he's fornicating at the time, most likely he's enjoying himself. But how does he, how does he feel when he finishes? The iman kicks back in, even if it's just a small amount. Because as the Prophet said, لا إذن الزاني that the mu'min does not make the, the fornication at the time he makes it, he's a real believer. Why? Because it's almost like his iman is gone. It hits zero. But then, when he finishes, it goes back a little bit. You know, to, up to five, up to six, seven. It goes up a little bit. He remembers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he feels bad inside. He feels the nedam. He feels the regret. So Ibn Jawzi said, remind yourself of this feeling before you even fall into it. And this will help you, inshallah, from not falling into it. Fourthly, he mentioned to picture this action you're doing 
if it was happening to somebody else. And And this story is a famous story that came in the hadith of the Prophet and this is where he took it from, is when the person came to him, the Sahabi came to him and said, you know, he liked Islam, but he said, uh, they'll give me permission, then leave zina, and to give me permission to make, to fornicate. He says, the only thing I don't really like about Islam is I can't fornicate. So the Prophet him, what did he say to him? Imagine now, we as Muslims, if somebody came to us and said this, what would we say to him? Now we smack him. You know, fear Allah. Taqillah. Now, because we're, we, we, we're harsh, that's how we are. We, should, we shouldn't be like this. The Prophet ﷺ, he's the Ra'uf al-Rahim bil ummah He's the, the one who's merciful with his ummah, with his nation. What did he say to him? He talked to him in logic. He said, Atardahu li ummak. Would you like this to happen to your, your mother? Somebody to fornicate with her? Obviously, what did the guy say? No. Your sister, your aunt, and like this, and so on and so forth. All your relatives, imagine if it was happening to them. Would you like it? He said, no. So also, even the Josie is saying here, also we benefit from this, to think about this. If you want to fornicate, you want to do something haram, imagine if somebody was doing it to you. If you want to steal something, or you want to this. Even when it comes to looking at that, which is haram. Now you find people who are offended. If you're, he's, you know, he's walking in the mall, and even if his wife is not covered properly, and, and you were looking at he'd get upset. What are you looking at? Huh? So, because now he doesn't want you to look. He might look elsewhere, but he doesn't want you to look at his wife. So now all this is the same thing. You don't, you don't want people to look at your wife, or you don't want people to harm your family in any way. Also, you should think about this before you fall into it. This will help you stay away from it, inshallah ta'ala. Fifthly, this last point he mentioned was, think about the benefit if you go against your desire. If you defeat your desire, what are the benefits you gain? Great benefits. First of all, in this dunya, you find the raha nafsiya, the peace of heart, the peace of mind that you wouldn't find unless you do this. As we mentioned before, Whoever turns away from my remembrance, he will live a difficult, a miserable life. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, إِنَّ الْأَبْرَارَ لَفِي نَعِيمٍ وَإِنَّ الْفُجَّارَ لَفِي جَحِيمٍ SubhanAllah, when I looked at this verse, and looked at the society, the society I came through, I came from in America, and I was giving a lecture, I said, we can gain and benefit from this. It's something I benefited from the reflecting of the Quran, which was that we understand from this verse that this will be in the hereafter. But also in this dunya, in this dunya, they will be also in a living hell. The people who are far away from the mercy of Allah, they will live almost like they're living in a living hell. And the people who are the abrar, the people who are the, the pious and the doers of good, they will live in this naim, this pleasure. Why? Because they are doing the good, doing what Allah SWT told them. And as he mentioned in the Quran, they find the assurance in their heart. That's why some of the Salaf, they said, if the Muluk, the, the rulers, they knew what we're in from Naim, from the blessing, they would have fought us with the swords because they're looking for the pleasure of the dunya and they can't find it through the, through the worldly things. But what we have from following the Quran and the Sunnah, we find this piece of art which everybody's looking for. So they said, now, if you look at this, the, the people of, of good, they're living in this Naim, this pleasure. And the people, who are far away, they're living in a living hell. And I remember when I watched one time on the news, uh, a famous actor, and it's okay to say his name, because everybody knows him, which is Robin Williams. He's a famous actor, and he's been acting since I was a, a, a kid. And I look, my look old, but I'm not that old, by the way. Uh, anyways, since I was young, he was acting. So we know who Robin Williams is. He was on a, on a TV show, or on the news, and he was addicted to alcohol. So he asked, they asked him, you know, why are you have this, this major problem with alcohol addiction? He said, and think about this, a person who is as famous as him, he has his star on Hollywood Boulevard, and he has all the money. He's, he's not a good looking guy, but I mean, he could probably have all the women because of the money he has and stuff like this. So all the pleasure of the dunya, he can have them. Nonetheless, he says, I'm living in a living hell. With those words, he said, I, you know, I, I, I felt like I was living in a living hell. And this is the same thing Allah SWT said in the Quran. So I said, SubhanAllah, the same thing that I, when I, I benefited from the ayah, we found it in these people. Famous any, any movie stars who have killed themselves, drugs, overdose, time and time again we see it. Why? Because they're trying to escape the living hell that they're living in. And then also in the hereafter, you'll find that even before the akhirah, also in their graves, the people who are from the abrar, from the doers of good, they will be in the grave which is rolled up from Riyadh al-Jannah, a garden from the garden of paradise, and the people who are from the al-fujjar, the evil people, the ones who do evil things, they will be and hufr from hufr al-nar. It will be a pit from the pits of the hellfire. May Allah protect all of this. 
after this, and he, about a year later, a brother sent me an SMS, and he mentioned that Ibn Qayy mentioned these three. So I was very happy to find this also. Ibn Qayy mentioned that the abrar, doers of good, they will be in all the levels of life. In this life, in their grave, and the hereafter, they will be in na'im, they will be in pleasure.